20th of his birth. Stories, poems, sound portraits, and of course music. That's the roundup at 206, 236 in Newfoundland, Monday afternoon on CBC Radio 1. Here's the CBC News. I'm Bob McGregor. Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder's Social Democrats have narrowly won Germany's closest post-war election. With 99% of the vote counted, official results show the Social Democrats and Greens combined won 47.1% of the vote. The conservative challengers led by Bavarian Governor Edmund Stoiber had 45.9% in an alliance with the Liberal Free Democrats who had 7.4%. Margaret Evans reports Greens will keep Schroeder in power. Really, I think the big winner tonight uh, is one of the smaller parties. It's the Greens. They've increased their vote. They're already in a coalition uh, with uh, Gerhard Schroeder's uh, Social Democrats, the Red-Green Coalition, um, and uh, he could not remain in power without that their support. That will make them, of course, more powerful. The Liberal Free, free Democrats... Uh, are trailing the Greens. They didn't do as well as they expected. Uh, one of their key uh, uh, politicians uh, was embroiled in a scandal earlier this week making uh, some comments, uh, some anti-Semitic comments. Um, that is, has uh, damaged their standing in the polls. And the PDS, the former communists from East Germany, they haven't done particularly well either. Uh, they might not even make it into Parliament. And one of their main policies was an anti-war stand on Iraq, but uh, Gerhard Schroeder uh, very shrewdly took that stand as his own uh, as well and, and sliced off some of their votes So, uh, with his own strong uh, anti-war message. CBC's Margaret Evans in Berlin. Israel says it has stopped demolishing Yasser Arafat's West Bank compound, but with the Star of David flag now flying over the Palestinian headquarters, Israel is demanding the surrender of the people inside. In a day of protests against the Israeli army siege, five Palestinians were killed by Israeli soldiers. Palestinian leaders have declared a general strike for Monday. They're appealing to the Arab world for help and calling on their people to resist the Israeli operation. General Motors workers in Canada have ratified their new contract, but the result was surprisingly low. 72% voted in favor of the deal. It contains an 8% in raises over three years. The president of the Canadian Auto Workers Union, Buzz Hargrove, is to announce in the morning whether he will next tackle Ford of Canada or Daimler Chrysler. Liberal MP Paul Martin is suggesting that the federal government should look at its funding for AIDS research. Martin made the comment as he took part in Montreal's 10th annual walkathon to raise awareness and money to battle the deadly disease. The former finance minister is touted as the front runner in the race for Prime Minister Jean Chrétien's job. The government in Quebec is being warned that doctors will leave the province unless working conditions improve. Bill 114 forces doctors to work extra shifts in understaffed emergency rooms. Doctors who refuse face severe penalties. Marie-Claude Lemieux reports. Medical specialists in Quebec are urging Health Minister François Legault to stop acting unilaterally. Their president, Dr. Yves Dugré, says they want to work out a solution with him. First, we ask could the Minister of Health to sit around the table, not threatening the doctor, and uh, this way we will find there is many solutions that more appropriate. Dugré says the problem goes beyond the emergency rooms. He thinks there's a severe shortage of doctors in the province, and a conscription-type law does nothing to entice doctors to stay. Dugré says there are many other solutions to address the problem, but he wouldn't give any specific example. He says they have to assess the situation first. As all these emergency rooms are well equipped, are, there is enough nurses there. Is it necessary that uh, all the emergency rooms be open all the night if they were in Quebec? Dugré deplores the minister's attitude, but he still hopes to be able to reach a deal with him as soon as possible, because he thinks many doctors will want to leave Quebec for other provinces or the United States. Marie-Claude Lemieux, CBC News, Montreal. That's the hourly news from CBC Radio. And here's a look at the Environment Canada weather forecast for New Brunswick. Cloudy with a few showers, mainly in western regions, giving fog patches and a low of 14. 
For tomorrow, cloudy with scattered showers and a high near 20. On Tuesday, cloudy with a 60% chance of showers in the east, a mix of sun and cloud in the west, a low of 10 and a high near 20. And that's the Environment Canada weather forecast. This is CBC Radio 1, 1070 AM Moncton. Good evening and welcome to Sunday Showcase on CBC Radio 1. I'm Linda Grierson. Tonight, we have a different kind of show for you. It's called Faster Than Light, and it's a pilot episode of a proposed new series for CBC Radio. Faster Than Light is modeled on classic science fiction magazines. You'll hear interviews and poetry, and because this is radio, its stories take the form of radio plays. The host of Faster Than Light is acclaimed science fiction author Robert J. Sawyer. Zero minus 60 seconds. Control to Rob Sawyer, do you copy, Rob? Rob here, Control. We still a go for liftoff? That's affirmative, Rob. All systems go. Great. Just wanted you to know that we've fixed the problem with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the thing. Excellent. How'd you fix it? Kicked it. One good swift kick. All it took. The light came right back on. Supposed to flash like that, right? Big red flashing. What? H- hang on. That's better. You guys have everything under control down there? You bet, Rob. So what's the flight plan today? Well, today we're going to see a young woman struggle with her true identity. Could she, in fact, be the alien captain of an interstellar starship? That's episode one of our science fiction serial, Captains Away. Later, we'll drop in on Nalo Hopkinson, an award-winning Canadian science fiction and fantasy writer. Also, we'll see how an emergency space shuttle pilot deals with a young stowaway whose presence on board his ship may doom both him and the people he's trying to save. A radio dramatization of Tom Godwin's classic short story, The Cold Equations. That's a lot of ground to cover in just one hour, Rob. Not a problem. Oh? Not when you can travel faster than light. Five, four, three, two, one... I'm Robert J. Sawyer, and this is Faster Than Light, featuring science fiction, fantasy, and the people who make it. First up, part one of Captains Away. Kudelka's Log, Tuesday, July 27th. It's been almost a month since the accident. I still can't believe he's gone. So lonely without him. I hear him all the time, but when I turn around to look for him, he's not there. What I wouldn't give to see that handsome little face one more time. Guilt is almost more than I can bear. It's my fault, after all. If only I hadn't left the window open. Maybe I should just replace him, but... I don't think I deserve another gerbil. Sometimes I don't think I deserve any pet at all. You first. It's me, Leonard. Leonard. Leonard Snodgrass, that you, Kadelka? Oh my, oh my God, um, I'm Mr. Mr. Snodgrass. What time is it? It's late is what time it is. Do you not think, Kadelka, that it's time you bought a clock? No, I have one. It just doesn't work is all I hate. Oh, oh work. I'm late. Oh, I'm late. It's not again. Hi, 
how you do it. Okay. Uh-oh. Well, you getting on or not? Um, <laughs> do you have change for a 20? We only take exact change. Oh, right. Darn. Uh, gee. Look, lady, what's it going to be, on or off? Hello. Maybe I can help? There. Is that enough? Thank you. You're quite welcome, Captain. Captain. <laughs> Right. Okay. Excuse me. Right. I'll just be moving on. Could you move your boot? Thank you. Excuse me. M- mind if I sit beside you, Captain? Yes. Be my guest. Thank you. Excuse me. Get, get over here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So, do you call everyone Captain? Just Captains, Captain. <laughs> Excuse me. Choki to Kime. I found the Captain. She's assumed the identity of a human female brunette with quite a smattering of freckles about her face. A clever disguise. Oh, my God. I'll keep you posted to choke you out. <laughs> You're asking yourself, uh, why am I talking to my watch? <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually. You, you see, it's not just a watch. It's also a communicator. We had them specially made. It's a clever, eh? Here, i show you. You see? Oh, I got it. It's a toy. No, Captain. It's not toy. It's as real as the kime. What? The kime. The kime. The kime, yes, the starship that brought us here. You're a little confused, aren't you? I, I don't realize that... <laughs> yeah, you think I'm the one that's confused. Thank heavens I found you in time before the enemy. Oh, Except the enemy... Okay, okay, look. Oh, oh my stop. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's my stop already. I've just got to get up. Excuse Excuse me. Me. Stop. Excuse me. Wait, wait. Captain, you don't understand. We need you. Wait, go. The mission is in the jeopardy. Captain, the key man needs you. Things just won't do without you. Third time this month, Kadalka. Third time. I'm sorry, Mr. Smogas, I promise it won't happen again. Mm-hmm. I'm getting a new clock. And then on the press, you know, there's this... Crack. You're on thin ice. Do you hear me? And it's melting, just like the polar ice cap. Be sorry to see it go. What go? The polar ice cap. Right. All those polar bears. Won't be a one left. Punctuality and polar bears, I shall mourn their passing. Right, Okay, get out there. Table 12's waiting. What's the matter with you? Take this tray. Weirdo's been waiting for half an hour already. Like I said, Mr. Snodgrass, I am... I don't really care. Go! Go! Okay, okay, okay. Whoa! Guys, really got an appetite. (laughs) Go! I'm going, 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 going. Here we are. Morning, sir. So sorry to keep you waiting. I must say, this is one heck of a big breakfast for just one... (gasps) You! A ploy to remain seated, Captain. No time to eat. Now listen. The enemy, they've affected your brain. We must get you back to the ship. Are you stalking me? Captain, please. Stop calling me that. I am not your captain or anyone's captain. I am a waitress. And you, sir, you need help. What's that? What do you got there? What do you... PTA, Captain. Personal time accelerator. For use in emergencies only, it'll buy us the time and the privacy we need. What? Oh, my God. What have you done? Oh, it's like they're all frozen. Everyone. Oh, my God. Oh, I just touched her and she fell over. I'm so sorry. It's okay. I just get up and stand her back up like so. Then watch her hit the table. Oh, that's going to leave a mark. Shame, too. Such a nice table. Just a little bit, bit there. Except for the big lump on her head. You should never know what happened. What exactly is happening? The personal time accelerator. It speeds us up. We're moving much faster than everyone else. Too fast for them to see or hear us. You got it? No. Okay. Doesn't matter. Not important. What is important is this. You are Captain Karen Kudelka of the Key Oh, here we go. 
about it. You're not from here. You're an alien. You've been hurt in some kind of accident. That's why you can't remember who you are. Might have been enemy action. Maybe you just slip on a banana. Hard to say. The thing is, we got to get you back to the Kimei before the damage becomes irreversible. Look, you, I don't know what kind of shenanigans you're up to or how you know my name, but I am not an alien. I'm a waitress. You, 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 this thing you've done. I get it. I'm just delusional is all. It's, it's the gerbil. It's the stress of his death. It's getting to me. The guilt. Oh, I'm losing my mind. Captain. I There's am. far too much at stake here. If I have to, I'll sling you over my back. That time's up. Grab onto something quick. What the Kadalka? Kadalka, was that you? Did you drop your? What has gotten into you? Look at this mess. As far as the eye can see, nothing but scrambled eggs. Mr. Snodgrass, you were frozen. What? All of you, just just, just like statues, you came back to life, and I must have... I must have jumped. I, uh, I didn't mean to. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just having a really bad day. Uh, um, oh. Day. Oh, oh, um, Karen, Karen. Uh, there, there. It's, it's, it's okay. Here, have a handkerchief. Thank you. <clears throat> it's drugs, isn't it? Huh? You disappoint me, Kadelka. Didn't think you were the type. No, 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 no. This is not drugs. You'll consider this an act of kindness someday. You. You're fired. Get help if you have to. Now get your things and get out! Fired? No, 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 you can't. The rent, how am I going to... Mr. Snodgrass, please. Captain, please. please. The dignity of your station, begging before a mere human. You stay out of this. My mind's made up. Oh, and... Kadelka? Mm-hmm? If you wouldn't mind, could you be a dear and clean this up before you go? Hmm? That was episode one of Captains Away, starring Christina Nichol as Karen Kudelka, Sergio DeZio played Chokey, and Richard Waugh played Leonard Snodgrass. Captains Away was written and recorded by Joe Mahoney, produced and directed by Barbara Worthy, with sound effects by Matt Wilcott, and casting by Julia Tate. Coming up on Faster Than Light, Tom Godwin's The Cold Equations. But first, a chat with award-winning science fiction and fantasy writer Nalo Hopkinson. Nalo Hopkinson's novel, Brown Girl in the Ring, won her the Warner Aspect First Novel Award in 1997. The same novel also won the Locus Award for Best First Novel. She is the recipient of the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer and the Ontario Arts Council's Foundation Award for Emerging Writers. Today, Nalo has two more novels under her belt. She's published a collection of short stories and edited an anthology of Caribbean fabulist fiction. And now she's here with us. Welcome to Faster Than Light, Nalo. Hi. You are one of the few black science fiction writers, and you reflect your culture, both your Canadian culture Mm -hmm. and your Caribbean culture. You were born in Jamaica in 1960, in the work that you do. And I suspect that surprises a lot of people, that science fiction has anything relevant to say about either Canada or the Caribbean. (laughs) Can you uh, fill us in on that? Well, I like to quote uh, Samuel Delaney, who who said once to a group of people... um, we need visions of the future and our people need them more than most. And uh, Delaney being who he is, our people means a lot of things. Um, Yeah, we're going to be there too, (laughs) not just, you know, Americans. So um, Delaney is black, Delaney is gay. He's gay. He's, uh, uh, yes, he is. He is many things, many things, many things to many people. Um, And so my feeling is, you know, you're always told when you when you write to write what you know. So I start from where I am, which is the background I have in both the Caribbean and Canada. Now, why the choice of doing fabulous fiction or science fiction uh, instead of straight mimetic, imitating everyday life fiction about those experiences? What extra 
dimension can you bring to it through science fiction? Well, for one thing, I write science fiction and fantasy because that's what I read. I, I don't read a whole lot of uh, mimetic fiction. Um, and that goes back to being a kid and just wanting something different. Uh, and I think all of us who read in this genre are there because we want to be shown something different. And so it's because I'm, I'm writing what I love. You've had an enormous success with your first couple of novels here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I read in an interview with you recently that you, you know, almost felt that it was a call for hubris to have been nominated for <laughs> yes. so many awards early on. <laughs> Has it been overwhelming, the, the positive reception in the science fiction field? It's been pretty overwhelming. I've been um, very grateful to people who've been so supportive. Um, it's gotten very strange very fast because I've gone from, you know, 1993, just beginning to think I could maybe take a writing course to now a few years later, I've got all this stuff published and I've won awards and people are starting to recognize me in the street. And it's, um, it is very odd. I keep waiting for the, you know, my legs to get cut out from under me. <laughs> The flip side is you've also been well hailed in the mainstream and literary communities. Do you find that there's any negative reaction these days still when they find out that what you're writing is published by Warner Aspect, a science fiction publisher Mm -hmm. in New York, instead of, say, a small feminist press, which would be much of your work would equally be at home there. Yes, um, yes, I do get I do get negative reactions. I've had uh, magazines decide that they don't want to interview me when they discover I'm a science fiction writer. Um, I get the same thing that you probably get, where people say that's not science fiction; it's good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there is that, but it still is the genre I love, so I stick with it. Now, this is radio, so no one else but me can see that you have a tattoo on your left arm, a (laughs) new tattoo celebrating the completion of a novel that took you two years to write. Tell us a bit about that book. A novel that tried to kill me. Um, The title at this point is is Griffon, uh, G-R-I-F-F-O-N-N-E. And Griffon was an old term when slavery was still in operation for a very light-skinned black woman. And so the novel is sort of exploring, it's kind of a time travel, fantasy, magic realism, it goes to a number of different places, it's exploring um, essentially black women's lives and the effect that slavery in various eras and various countries had on them. Um, And the the tattoo was to celebrate that I, I finished and I won, it did not kill me. Now that I've mentioned it, you better describe the tattoo for us. Well, this is, um, it's from Ghana. It's an Adinkra symbol, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but um, it's called Nkinkin. It means changing oneself always. So, of course, I got it embedded on my arm in something that will never, ever change. Uh, <laughs> Writerly irony. <laughs> yes. And the shape of it, it's very stylized and, and it's very square, but it looks a little bit like an Afro comb with a bendy handle. <laughs> well, now that we've made a, a clear picture for everybody in their minds of what it looks like. <laughs> or a barcode, depending on you know, how far away you're standing from To me, it looks like a barcode or a compressed um, optometrist's letter chart, where they've all been squished together. And you have to yes, say which way the, yeah. the, the E's are facing yeah. on it. It looks like an E with four prongs lying on its toes with a bendy handle. And that's constantly reinventing oneself? What was it? Changing oneself always. Which is a fabulous motto for a writer. I think so. You also recently had in stores, and it's still available, of course, Whispers from the Cotton Tree Root, an anthology, which means it's stories by other people that you've collected together. Tell us a bit about that book. Whispers has 20 stories in it. One of them is mine. Um, I was approached uh, a few years ago at the International Conference of the Fantastic in the Arts by uh, the editors who were looking for someone to um, to do an anthology of Caribbean fabulist fiction. Um, and first we had to figure out what fabulist meant because I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> And I'd never edited an anthology before and always wanted to. Uh, so I, I put this together for them. I, my, I come from um, a family of writers. My father was a writer. And Slade Hopkinson, the Slade poet. Slade Hopkinson, yes, poet, playwright, actor. 
Um, and I know a lot of the Caribbean writers uh, in the English-speaking world. So I was able to very quickly kind of throw out a call for submissions, and they all said, well, that's cool, but what does fabulous mean? <laughs> and uh, so I came up with a description, and off we went, and, and pretty soon I had an anthology. It was a lot of fun to do. Now, this word fabulous comes up, and one area where you and I tend to disagree in mm-hmm. this field is I make no bones about the term science fiction, and I'm proud to call myself a science fiction writer. You prefer the term speculative fiction. So here's your chance to tell me why I'm wrong and sell me on on this this term speculative fiction. That does have some currency, obviously. It does have some currency. I find I'm using it less and less because people just don't know what it means, like, you know, fabulous. Um, And it's not that I prefer it. It's just that it does seem to include me in ways that science fiction doesn't. I'm I'm primarily a fantasy writer. uh, And I like the thought of, of fictions that speculate on what the world might be like if it were different. And that's largely, I think, what many of the uh, uh, writers in our genres are doing. So it's why I tend to throw the term around, but I also stand up loud and proud and ignorant for science fiction and fantasy. (laughs) When you say speculating about how the world might be different, is it fair to say that you're an agenda-driven writer? Are you trying to accomplish something other than just passing some hours on the beach with your your reading? novels. I had Somebody uh, review uh, my second novel once, Midnight Robber, and say that it was pleasant summertime reading. <laughs> and I thought, you know, this is a man I'd like to meet. Because, <laughs> you know, there's incest, there's rape. And I thought, well, okay, pleasant summertime reading. <laughs> um, I like to tell a good story. Primarily, the story needs to to hopefully grab the reader by the lapels and, and make them unable to stop turning the pages. Once they're turning the pages, though, yeah, there's a thing or two I'd like to tell them. So, so I think I have both agendas going on. And specifically, what is it that you do want to tell them? It really, really depends on, on what's, you know, getting on my nerves in any particular at any particular moment. Partly with science fiction and fantasy, as someone who's read them since I was a child, part of my agenda is to... Uh, have those fictions include me in real ways. It's very gratifying to get the response from readers who are Caribbean, are black, or just, you know, not have, have not seen themselves in any real ways in this fiction to say, finally, there's something that isn't unicorns and duckies and medieval history. Finally, there's a future that, that, that remembers that there will be people of color there, there will be, you know, poor people there, um, there will be people who aren't from North America there. So partly that's it, just to, and then just to tell the, the same kinds of stories that grip us all, you know, stuff about you know, love and hate and betrayal and, and all the awful and wonderful things that people can do to each other. So primarily I want to tell a story, but I want to tell a story that, that, that looks and sounds a little different. Excellent. Nalo Hopkinson, the current book in stores right now is Midnight Robber. Skin Folk is also there as well. And Skin Folk, collection. the collection of your short stories. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us on Faster Than Light. Thank you very much, Rob. Tom Godwin wrote science fiction from 1953 until the 70s, producing three novels and several short stories. He wrote his most famous and enduring work in the second year of that career, a hard science fiction short story called The Cold Equations. A principal tenet of what is called hard science fiction is that physical laws rule the universe. As human beings, we are at the mercy of those laws. We ignore them at our peril. The Cold Equations by Tom Godwin. Oh, no, Chloe. 
Okay. Get out of there. I said out. Please don't shoot me. You're not gonna shoot me, are you? I give up. What are you doing here? I... I was on board the Stardust. I figured that much. What are you doing here now? I heard there was a ship going to Woden. That's where you're going, right? To Woden? Are, are you going to shoot me? Shoot you? Oh, uh, no, I guess not. Why in blazes would you want to go to Woden? There's nothing on Woden but rocks and trees. There's nothing for little girls. That's where my brother lives. He works there. He's a surveyor. I want to see him. I haven't seen him since I was just little. I miss him a lot. Chloe does too, don't you, Chloe? Your brother. Well, that's great. That's just great. Even brought the family pet along. Terrific. Chloe, you say? How old is she? She's six. She was born on Earth. You know, on a real farm. That's what the pet store man told my brother anyway. A real farm? How about that? Wow. It looks like a hayseed now that you mention it. Yellow stripes and all. So, you two were traveling alone on board the Stardust? Yep. And you were going to... Mimer. Mimer. What you got waiting for you there? My father. Mom says I have to see him. I'd like to see him, I guess. He is my father and all, you know. But I just saw him last year, and I'd much rather see my brother. Do you think I'll get to see him? Does your brother know you're here? I, I mean, that you were on board the Stardust? Of course. He's the one paying for it all. He's real generous. He makes tons of money, and he sends it all back home. Mom says he's our favorite son. <laughs> he's my favorite brother. Actually, he's my only brother. But even if he wasn't, you know. Right. So does he have a name, this brother of yours? Jerry. Jerry Cross. He's in... Crew 2. That's what his address says, anyway. Do you know him? Nope. What are you doing? You're not turning around, are you? I'd really like to see my brother. Are you taking us back to the Stardust? Too late for that, I'm afraid. I'm just slowing down, trying to save on fuel. Why? Because we don't have a whole lot. This is Barton, EDS 2F100. This is an emergency. Give me Commander Delhart, please. Are you ordering them to come back and get me? Uh, shh. Delhart here. What's this about an emergency? I have a stowaway. I see. Well, that's unusual, but hardly an emergency. You found him in time, didn't you? Inform ship's record so his relatives can be notified. Well, that's just it, Commander. The stowaway's still aboard. The circumstances are a bit different this time. Different? What do you mean, different? You only have so much fuel, and you know the law as well as I do. Stowaways must be jettisoned immediately. What? What did he say? It's okay. What does it's he okay. mean? Relax. The commander, I have two stowaways. A girl, she looks about 11, and a, a cat. The girl wants to see her brother, commander. He's one of their surveyors. She's just a kid. She didn't know what she was doing. Okay. So you thought maybe there was something I could do? Yeah. Well, there isn't. I'm sorry. I know how you must feel, Barton, but you know as well as I do that I could never get the Stardust turned around in time to help you. And even if I could, we've got a schedule to maintain. This ship supplies half a dozen worlds. The lives of thousands of people depend on us. What about another shuttle? Barton. Uh, she's just a kid, sir. It's not her fault. She doesn't deserve to... Look, if you launched now, in the next few minutes, have you made the jump to light speed yet? No, we have not. But listen to me, Launch sir. the shuttle, sir. Maximum velocity. I, I know what you're thinking. It won't make it in time. Well, maybe it will, and maybe it won't. We can crunch the numbers later, but one thing's for damn sure. It won't make it if you don't launch it. If it doesn't work, and you put this off for too long... I understand, sir, but she's just a kid. We, we have to do something. We have to at least try. Okay. I make no promises, but I'll see what I can do. Thank you, sir. Don't thank me yet. You need to prepare for the worst. Yes, sir. I want you to maintain proper protocol. 
If nothing else, it'll keep your mind off things until I get back to you. I'm connecting you to ship's records. What did he mean, prepare for the worst? What did he mean about stowaways being... jettisoned? Does that mean what I think it means? That can't be what he said. No way. What's gonna happen to me? Tell me, what did he mean? He meant it the way it sounded. No. You're punishing me. Just trying to scare me into never doing anything like this again, right? Isn't that what you're doing? I'm sorry. Maybe I should have told you right away. But... If you... Jettison me... I'll die. I know. You know? I know, but it might not come to that. I just wanted to see my brother. Chloe and me, we didn't do anything to die for! I know you didn't. Hello, EDS Ships Records here. Do you have the uh, subject's identification disc candy? I'll need your ID, please. Take it. Just take it! Thanks. Uh, identification number T837. Now hold your horses. This is for the gray card, right? Uh, well, for now. And? The time of death? The subject's still alive. Still a lot? What do you mean, still a lot? What are you gonna... Look, pal, the subject's just a little girl. She's got a cat, and it's still alive, too. Both of them can hear every word you're saying. Do you get it? Oh. Sorry. Nobody told me. No one's gonna die. Not if I can help it. Okay? How are you... Never mind. Why don't you just give me, give me what you got? Eight three seven four dash Y five four, Marilyn Lee Cross, female, born July seventh, twenty one sixty, eleven years old, one hundred and forty five centimeters, thirty eight kilos, brown hair, blue eyes, blood type O, bound for Port City, Memer. Hey, oh, that, that's great. Thanks. Hey, you want the cat too? Uh, no. No, we don't, we don't do cats as, as a rule. All right, then. Pardon out. Why? Why what? Why do you have to... have to jettison people who stow away? What will happen to Chloe? Nobody wants anything to happen to either of you, Marilyn. Nobody. Least of all me. And the problem is... I, where do I even begin? Do you know why this shuttle was launched? You're bringing supplies to Woden. Emergency supplies. I'm taking serum. A kind of medicine for something called Kala Fever. It's for the six surveyors in Survey Crew 1. Not the one your brother's in. A different crew. If I don't reach them in time, those six people in Survey Crew 1 will die. Won't you reach them in time? Well... We have a bit of a problem. Shuttles like this one only have just enough fuel to get where they're going. They're not very big, and that's the way they're designed. Everything is calculated very precisely out here on the frontier. With you and Chloe aboard, uh, neither of you weigh very much, but uh, still. The extra weight means we'll use up our fuel before we reach the ground. That means we'll crash. And you, me, and Chloe will die. And so will the six people waiting for the serum. You just don't have enough fuel? That's right. So we can't stay here? Me and... Me and Chloe? No. They're sending another shuttle back to get us, right? The commander said he'd see what he could do. Well, what if... What if he can't? Here's a notebook. I'll see if I can get him for you. EDS 2F100, Survey Crew 2, come in, please. This is Survey Crew 2. What's up, EDS? I need to talk to Jerry Cross. Is he around? He's up on the survey. Should be back soon, though. I'll have to respond. Does he have a radio where he is by any chance? Oh, sorry, yeah, no. Well, what's going on? Not bad news, I hope. Have him call me the instant he gets in. It's very important. Well, then. Just get him there as soon as you can. I'll do the best I can. Thanks. EDS out. Shit. 
sure hope he gets back in time. If we don't get rescued, will you send these for me? Sure. Of course. Do you think Jerry will make it back to camp? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. They said he'd be back soon. I hope so. I don't feel very well. Can I... Can I tell you something? Of course. I... I think Chloe's scared. I think she's scared the shuttle's not going to make it. She seems really scared to me. Well, uh, maybe if you pet her. Maybe that would make her feel better. Okay. Can I tell you something else? Sure. I miss my mom and my friends. That's only... It's, it's only natural. I'm so glad Chloe's here. <laughs> yeah. She's a nice cat. Likes to purr, doesn't she? Yeah. It's cold in here, isn't it? Does it seem cold to you? Yeah. It is cold. Colder than it ought to be. I sure hope Jerry gets back soon. Do you think he will? Or were you just saying that? No, I think he will. They said he'd be back soon. This camp will be out of range in a few minutes, though. So, there might not be a whole lot of time left to talk to him when he comes in. I'm sorry about that. I'd call him right now if I could. Jerry? Still not to bug. Oh. Yes, Commander. I'm afraid it's bad news. There's no way the second shuttle could reach you in time. The numbers don't lie, you're too far away. We've been moving away from one another for too long. Commander, but what if I'm it... sorry, sir. I'm really sorry. You know what you have to do? How much was it you weighed? Huh? There's gotta be something in here, something we can we can throw out, huh? Look at this stupid chair! You've got this bolted in! What about, what about... This doesn't weigh enough. Why can't I... There's nothing! Nothing on this whole goddamn shuttle I can throw out to make it weigh less! Damn it! Nothing. Except me. trying to help me kind of reminds me of Jerry. Thanks. My kitten, the one I had before Chloe, uh -huh. it got run over when I was six. Oh, sorry. Jerry told me that Chloe, she was called Chloe too, he told me that Chloe was just going to be gone long enough to get herself a new fur coat. He said I'd find her on the foot of my bed the next morning. He made me feel so much better. I dreamt about her all night. And when I woke up the next morning, Guess what? What? She was there, just like Jerry said she'd be, in a brand new fur coat. <laughs> a couple of years later, Mom told me what really happened. Jerry got the pet store guy out of bed and told him he was either going to sell him the kitten with the yellow stripes, even though the store was closed, or Jerry'd break his neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> Jerry? It's Jerry! Jerry? Jerry Cross. Yeah, that's right. The bad news. What is it? Hello? Jerry? Marilyn? I wanted to see you. Marilyn? What are you doing there? I wanted to see you. I wanted to see you, so I hid on the shuttle. Chloe's here, too. You hid on it? I'm a stowaway, Jerry. I... I didn't know what it would mean. Marilyn? I... It's not... 
I just wanted to see you. I didn't want to hurt anybody. Don't cry, Marilyn. Don't cry. It's alright. Sorry. Everything's alright. I, I... I wanted to say goodbye to you. Because I have to go soon. I wanted to say goodbye. I'm oh, sorry. Wanted to say goodbye. Pilot, have you called the Stardust? I did. It can't turn back, and there's no other starship within 40 light years. You're sure there's nothing else you can do? You've considered everything. Your calculations were all correct? Yes. I'd never let this happen if I wasn't absolutely sure. Believe me, I, I did everything I could. If there was anything at all I, I, I could do now, I would do it. He tried to help me, Jerry. He even tried throwing a chair outside. No one could help me. And, <clears throat> and I'm not going to cry anymore. And everything will be all right with you and Mom and Dad. Right? Sure. Sure it will. We'll be fine. He's starting to go out of range. Uh, another minute he'll be gone. You're fading out, Jerry. You're going out of range. We have to say goodbye. I love you, Jerry. Tell Mom and Dad I love them too, okay? Okay. I was thinking, maybe you'll dream about me. About me crying because the kitten is dead. Or or maybe you'll dream that I'm a gold-winged lark. Yeah. The ones you used to tell me about. Yeah. And I'll be singing my silly head off for you. For you, Jerry. Wouldn't that be nice? If you jumped about me that way. You would. Marilyn. That would be really nice. I have to go now, Jerry. Goodbye. Jerry. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, little sister. Don't be scared, Chloe. We have to do this. We have to do it for Jerry. It's people like him who are sick. And they'll die if we don't... If we don't go outside. I'm scared too, Chloe. We're ready. EDS 2F100 to start us. I'm resuming deceleration. Barton out.
The Cold Equations by Tom Godwin. Featuring Matthew McFadgen as Barton, Vivian Endicott Douglas as Marilyn Lee Cross, Sean Smythe as Jerry Cross, Andrew Gillies as Commander Delhart, Sergio DeZio as the clerk, and Jennifer Dean as the surveyor. The Cold Equations was dramatized and recorded by Joe Mahoney, produced and directed by Barbara Worthy, with sound effects by Matt Wilcott, and casting by Julia Tate. I'm Rob Sawyer, and this is Faster Than Light, but now Much Slower Than Light by poet Carolyn Clink. My poem reflects my frustration at um, trying to understand the concept of relativity. It's like the famous saying, if you're driving a car at the speed of light and you turn on your headlights, what happens? I just couldn't come around to that whole concept in my brain and, and just had to realize that I am Newtonian and that's okay with me. I am Newtonian. My frame of reference is my frame of preference. A pox on your twin paradox and your atomic clocks. It's too much of a bother being my own grandfather. I'll just stay home and wait in my own steady state. Much Slower Than Light by Carolyn Clink. I'm William B. Davis from the X-Files. And you're listening to Faster Than Light. Earlier we heard our adaptation of The Cold Equations by Tom Godwin. That's one of the most famous stories in all of science fiction. What makes it so memorable, of course, is that it doesn't have a happy ending. Those whose only exposure to science fiction has been through television or movies are used to the characters coming up with a technological solution to every problem. That's what makes that kind of SF just mindless escapism. But in the cold equations, nothing like that happens. Far from being escapist, it's a story about the inescapability of physical laws. And it's because of that unswerving commitment to harsh truths that science fiction is, in fact, often more realistic than other forms of literature. As some of you know, I'm not just the host of Faster Than Light. I'm also a science fiction writer myself. My most recent novel, Hominids, starts out with a woman being raped on the campus of Toronto's York University. In the online discussion group about my work, just today somebody wrote, I set hominids down for about two weeks after the short but graphically depicted rape scene. I couldn't understand why a science fiction book would need such a scene. Well, to me, the scene was obviously necessary. The woman in question is the main character, and the rape defines everything that she feels and thinks for the rest of the novel. More, the book is thematically very much about the violence men cause in society, and a rape was the perfect symbol for that. Note that the person making the comment didn't say, I couldn't understand why any book needed such a scene. He, and it was a he, by the way, said very specifically that he couldn't understand why a science fiction book needed such a scene. In other words, he apparently expected nothing but pleasant escapism from science fiction. Certainly the SF genre is capable of that, but in my view, it should never be limited to that. There's no part of the human experience that isn't appropriate fodder for SF. Sure, there's little excuse for gratuitous sex or violence in any form of writing, but neither is there any reason to expect them to be absent from any kind of literature, least of all one that is so intimately concerned with fundamental questions. For you see, despite the popular misconception to the contrary, science fiction isn't really about spaceships and aliens. Those are just tools that let us metaphorically examine issues that otherwise might be too hot politically or emotionally to look at head on. And this isn't some kind of newfangled postmodernist notion of SF. Rather, it goes right back to the genre's 19th century roots. To read H.G. Wells' The Time Machine as just a rollicking adventure is to wholly miss the point. In fact, that's what Wells' own grandson did when he made the 2002 film version of that tale. The Time Machine is first and foremost a scathing indictment of the class system in Great Britain. 
Likewise, it's superficial to read H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds as just a Victorian version of Star Wars, a mindless shoot 'em up Rather, it's a story about the cruelty of British colonialism, with the Martians standing in for Her Majesty's expansionist forces, and the Brits themselves feeling what it's like to be subjugated by technologically superior but heartless beings. Here at Faster Than Light, we hope to continue to bring you stories that make you both think and feel. Yes, of course, we'll always strive to be entertaining, but just like Tom Godwin in The Cold Equations, we will never shy away from harsh realities, because such realities are what good science fiction is all about. I'm Robert J. Sawyer. You've been listening to Faster Than Light, featuring science fiction, fantasy, and the people who make it. Faster Than Light was written by Joe Mahoney and produced by Barbara Worthy, with sound effects by Matt Wilcott and music by Rod Crocker. Special thanks to James Roy and Dave Carley. I'm Robert J. Sawyer, taking off. You've been listening to Faster Than Light, hosted by Robert J. Sawyer. Faster Than Light also featured music composed and performed by Wayne Richards, and Sandra Breitman was the associate producer. For $21, you can order a copy of tonight's show on CD. Just call 416-205-5966. Again, that's 416-205-5966. Or you can send a check payable to CBC, to Radio Drama on CD, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W, 1E6. And if you'd like to hear it again right away, simply tune in tomorrow to Monday Night Playhouse at 9.05 p.m. on CBC Radio 2 for a repeat of tonight's show. Next week, we present Vested Interest by Emile Scher. It's the story of a young woman in the fashion business who, while traveling through Asia, comes upon an unusual technique for designing fabric. After learning it for the master, she takes it home to Canada, where it becomes a huge and lucrative success. But should she get all the credit? What about that humble tailor who introduced her to the craft? That's Vested Interest, one week from now. If you're an Internet user, send us an email with your comments on our show. You can reach us at sunshowcase at toronto.cbc.ca or send us a letter to Sunday Showcase, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W, 1E6. I'm Linda Grierson for Sunday Showcase. Stay with us for Katie Malik and Jazz Beat on CBC Radio 1. Good night. sparkle to your night with Northern Lights. I'm Andrea Ratuski. I hope you'll tune in for some fine classical music recordings along with a smattering of world music and jazz. Join me weeknights on CBC Radio 1 starting at 11 p.m. and on Radio 2 at 4 a.m.